So we talked about the fact that uh, the people who struggle the most with consuming fiber right now are the people that actually require the most help and probably people who have the 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 most problematic microbiomes, okay? So you propose in your first book that the diversity of fiber, not the amount of fiber per se, but the diversity of fiber is actually the number one indicator that can actually improve your gut health and reverse the dysbiosis process. Um, and I love this idea because it's actually, it's a great way to think about eating more plant material, but also eating more diverse plant material, not just eating the same three or four foods over and over again, right? But now, in when you go onto the internet and you are surfing on Instagram or YouTube and you try and, you know, just learn some more information about health, you're hit with other people who kind of confuse the subject a little bit. And, you know, it's easy to start to believe that, well, if you're struggling with gut issues, well, the reason is because you don't have enough collagen in your diet and you should go get a collagen supplement, right? Or people are like, oh, no, 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 you have gut bloating? That's because you have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You should go get uh, a supplement that's going to help you reverse SIBO, right? And so people kind of like go down this track and then they start to sort of chase different things that could be wrong, even though they don't necessarily have a firm diagnosis of, of any digestive problem. And, and, and they end up wasting many years of their life looking for a solution and then coming up to the same conclusion, you know, five years down the road where they're like, huh, my digestive processes still don't work. In fact, they might've even gotten worse over the course of time, right? So here's my question for you. Um, in, in, in the Fiberful cook Cookbook, you talk about uh, people who have difficulty consuming fiber as like, that can manifest in a number of different ways. Right, people can become constipated as an example. Constipation can lead to gas and flatulence, right? You can have excessive histamine production and um, that can also cause some serious digestive problems. So um, personally, I was struck by the entire section about histamine production because before reading your book, I knew nothing about histamine, nothing. I knew, you know, yes, you can produce histamine from mast cells within your own immune system, but beyond that, how do you get it from food? What does it do? You know, are you producing too much? Are you not producing enough, et cetera? So could we go into a little bit of detail here about uh, why should people care about histamine? What do they need to know? And um, how would somebody know if they actually have, you know, an excess production of histamine to begin with? All right, let's start here. There are going to be people who are listening right now that this is going to change their life. Because the problem is that this is real. It exists. But you're going to hear me describe why this is such a challenge for your doctor to actually grapple with and tell you whether or not you have histamine intolerance. So taking it from the top, we're hearing the word histamine. What is histamine? Histamine is a uh, signaling molecule that you will find in your body. It's there right now. We have it like in our bloodstream literally right now every single one of us. And when our body is healthy and in balance, histamine is a part of that story. We have histamine receptors in our brain, in our blood vessels, in our digestive system, in many different places. And, but the problem is that when, like, like anything else in human health, when things fall out of balance, they can become problematic. When you have disproportionate amounts of histamine coursing through your blood, that can be problematic because then you are excessively stimulating these histamine receptors. And then we'll, as a result of that, you will manifest symptoms that you frankly don't want. Like they weren't supposed to be there, but they're there because you have too much histamine in your blood. So what, how does this happen? How do we end up with excessive levels of histamine in our blood? It tends to be that you have consumed too much histamine in your diet. Now, this uh, histamine intolerance, first of all, people who have this, they have a damaged gut. So there's that, like this is not the person with a healthy gut who has this issue. But if you have a damaged gut, then you are, you are prone to the possibility of having histamine problems. Um, before I jump into like, what are the foods that can be high in histamine? 
I want to first start by describing the symptoms because as a person is sitting there, I want uh, like the listeners at home to quite simply consider, is this me? Am I this person? So the number one symptom of histamine intolerance is gas and bloating. If you have gas and bloating, you should be paying attention right now. You can have many other digestive symptoms with histamine intolerance. So it could be like cramping, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, um, acid reflux. We could keep going. Basically, if you have digestive symptoms, histamine intolerance is in play. But then it could also be headaches, migraines, brain fog, lightheadedness, a runny nose, sinus issues, sinus congestion, sore throat, rapid heart rate, palpitations like funny heartbeats, feeling like you're going to faint, could be skin issues, like it could be a rash, flushing, basically meaning like redness of the skin, hives. Um, so when you think about this, we're talking about like all these different parts of the body. I'm running through, you know, not just your gut, but I'm also including neurologic symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms. I'm including dermatologic symptoms. So there's that complexity. And this is part of the reason that it's hard for your doctor because your doctor most likely is not thinking about piecing all these unique symptoms together into one thing. Um, but if you have two of the symptoms that I just described, then you may have histamine intolerance. So how do we diagnose histamine intolerance? Well, here's the problem. There's no blood test. There's no CAT scan. There's no radiology test. There's no simple way for your doctor to know whether or not you have histamine intolerance. The way that you have to do it is you have to go home and eat a low histamine diet and do that preferably for two weeks. So like, what is a low histamine diet? What are these foods? Th again, like this is so hard because your doctor is never going to hand you the recipes that you would need to be able to pull this off. Here's what's exciting. I am like, that's what I'm here to do literally right now. Um, this to me is like part of what I'm insanely excited about with this new book is that this is effectively me reaching out to you with 26 low histamine recipes that if I didn't tell you they were low histamine, you would just think, oh, Dr. B is serving some delicious food to me. But you go home and you take these 26 recipes and you try this. This is like all you got to do. Don't worry about the complexity. Just like literally eat these recipes for two weeks and tell me how you feel. Did you notice that your runny nose and your sinus issues got better? Did you notice that the hives or the, or the flushing went away, that your bloating is improved? Okay. If the answer is yes, I just changed your life because we just discovered something that your doctor was never going to diagnose that is driving your specific health issue. This is understanding the root of the problem. And we have just empowered you with that knowledge. So this is to me part of what's really exciting. By the way, the um, I mentioned earlier that there are over 400 references in this book. This chapter alone on histamine intolerance has 90. It's the most references that I have in any one chapter. And wow, it's fascinating. because I'm going, I'm going hard on, look, this is the science and you can see the limitations of trying to get this done because we don't have a good test for it other than I need you to eat this way. So now, uh, real quick, cause I'm sure you guys have questions that you're wondering about, but I just want to add real quick, a, a general overview of the foods that are commonly associated with histamine intolerance. By the way, it's not mostly plant foods. Um, the number one would be fermented foods. So that can be all different types of fermented foods that include, I hate to break it to everyone, but that could include alcohol and vinegar and chocolate. Chocolate. Yep. Yep. So if you're someone who's like, yo, I eat these foods and like, I, I know I get runny nose. Okay. See what this is what we're now we're starting to connect the dots here. Now we're on to something. Fish is the, like one of the outside of fermented foods, fish would go number one in terms of high histamine. 
Um, number of different animal products have been associated with high histamine. And then in the plant world, there are four particular plants that you need to be conscious of. Spinach, eggplant, tomatoes, and avocados. Those are the four. So if for anyone who's listening, you're like, gosh, when I eat that, what that food that Dr. B is describing, I get these funny symptoms and I've never really understood what they were. Again, like this, this could be it. We may be onto something here. Okay. Well, I want to say, so this is part of what makes this book so special is again, like it's a completely, I think it's like a whole new creation, honestly, in the way how like these 26 recipes you're talking about, they're, they're in like the histamine chapter. Yeah. And then there was like certain recipes in the FODMAPs chapter. Right. And so it's like there's certain recipes intertwined based on th the things that people are saying yes to as they're reading the book. Like this kind of like you said, like it's choose your own path. Like, okay. This is where my problem is. Like, let me focus on these recipes in this chapter. And I got to tell you, these 26 recipes are, are quite beautiful and they're going to be delicious. So it's not really a much of a sacrifice to try this out and see maybe this is something you're struggling with. Yeah, and I and th so it's right. We have, there are two recipe based um, food intolerance protocols. One is the histamine protocol, and one is the FODMAP protocol. Both of which allow you to test and understand what's going on with your body. But let's pretend that you have no gut health issues, right? Like you're the 2022 version of Cyrus, not the 2012 version of Cyrus. Oh yeah, yeah. So who's a beast? Right, this dude is a beast, and he's a plant <laughs> plant smashing beast. So, like, let's pretend you're that guy, right? Well, you're gonna find all the 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 teaching that exists in the Fiberfield Cookbook could be fascinating, and hopefully, what you're gonna do is be like, oh my gosh, I have a friend who has this issue. Here's this book, check it out, right? That's what I'm hoping is gonna happen. But like, if you're just there for the recipes, you, you need. I'm glad you're there. You need to be here. Like, the, you need to be a part of this right? You don't need to have food intolerances to do this book. And you go to the, let's pretend you go, like Cyrus goes to the histamine intolerance chapter. He's like, you know what? I don't have histamine intolerance. I can eat all this food. I have no issues. Okay, cool. Um, I will literally tell you what substitutions to make in these recipes that make them high histamine and make them like even tastier. So you, you have basically these protocols low histamine, low FODMAP, but then within those recipes, I'm going to give you modifications that you can make when you're ready to increase your histamine or you're ready to increase your FODMAPs and train your gut. Yeah, that's super unique. I love that. Uh, what Will, what's your favorite recipe in the book? Do you have one? Dang, man. Uh, all right. It's hard to choose. Man. It is hard to choose. So let me say this, that I... Coming into plant-based eating, what I have discovered that I have loved the most is that plant-based foods are the most celebrated foods from cultures around the planet. So just like choose a food culture and insert yourself and you're going to like discover that you're consuming delicious plant-based meals. And so I love that like in this book is a celebration, not just of plants, but of different cultures across the globe. We have Vietnamese food, Thai food, Japanese food. Uh, we have Mediterranean food. We have Mexican food. We have it all. We have American food. Um, and so if I had to go with one, dang man, uh, I made a really delicious tofu banh mi. So a banh mi is a, it's a um, Vietnamese fusion sandwich. Basically, it's combining like French, like French cuisine with Vietnamese cuisine. So it's a French roll, um, and you're adding in like a bunch of different Vietnamese type foods, like cilantro and pickled carrots and um, perhaps peanuts. So I have our plant-based take, our fiber field take on a Vietnamese banh mi, and. Um, it's pretty spectacular. It's got like the heat that I like, so it's delicious. <laughs>